you why you lie. Ring, ring the banjo, I like that good old song. How did we get from this to this in the space of four years? Well, it's down to a place that provided a platform for a whole new generation of comics, London's Comedy Store. The Comedy Store first opened its doors in 1979. I first appeared here doing stand-up in 1982, and I still appear every week at the Comedy Store with the Comedy Store players. We're an improvisation troupe, we make it up as we go along, it's jolly funny. Here is a marvellous picture of Robin Williams. I've always admired this when I walk down these stairs, the Pete and Don at the Comedy Store, thanks for the break, Robin Williams. The fact that he took the time to write that I think is, is wonderful. And down here we have our box office on our left, and a selection of adverts here, Comedy's unofficial National Theatre. I don't know what you're like with acronyms. Now let's go into the auditorium. It's a busy night, as you can hear, because the Comedy Store players are about to go on stage. So if we go through here, we see that busy, busy auditorium. There's a bar at the back over this way. Here's a man carrying two pints of beer. And if we follow this way, this is quite a good way to the stage. Normally the audience wouldn't come this way. As you can sense, there is a buzz, there is an ambience, there's a real thrill about what's happening this evening. Now I'll just take you to the front here and just say that if you can hence feel the atmosphere, feel the ambience, feel the sense of that, follow me now as we go into the Comedy Store Players dressing room and they're just going to be this way, so just let these gentlemen finish here and enjoy your beer and I'll just go in here and I'll show you exactly what's going to happen. They don't appear on television much these days so um, let's have a look to see how they actually get ready before an impro gig. Well, as you can see, it's lots of fun. And up here we have the auditorium, the one we've just left, full of people. Let's go out there, let me show you something no comic has ever experienced. And that's it. Silence. Because you either get big laughs here, or you get people screaming at you. But here, just for this moment, we have silence. Savour it, you won't be hearing it again. There's no like show business, like no business. in the heart of the comedy store. This is the third comedy store you, 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 you've owned. Yes. Um, and this is the best, would you say? Well, it's reputed to be the world's best, as uh, Mike Wilmot, a famous com Canadian comedian, uh, declares to all and sundry from the stage, and uh, even when he's in the comedy store in America, uh -huh. which must piss them off tremendously, <laughs> that London has the finest uh, comedy room in the world. You're in the wrong business. I mean, forget comedy, forget being a movie star, or life insurance wrong. salesman. I life insurance women. salesman, the sexiest man in the world. Will, women will st stop at nothing to buy life insurance. So you had a nightclub owner and a life insurance salesman. Relatively harmless on their own, a bit like nitro and glycerine, but put the two together and you have a powerful combination. Powerful enough to set up a comedy club that's going to change the face of stand-up. Soho was a different, it was in a way more exciting, I feel, yeah, yeah. back then, because it did feel a bit, there was a kind of like a, a threatening ambience about the place, yes. and you weren't quite sure what was going on, and, and there was always the, the feeling that there were things going on behind the doors that were more exciting than anything you'd encountered. Yes, and yes. And in a way, that kind of, I think, fed off that, so you lived up to that. Soho wasn't a place I went to, because I just it had a reputation. I mean, it's a groovy place now. <clears throat> but I remember going down that little alley, Mad Street, and then there were literally women hanging out the windows. Hello, lovey, come inside, and all this sort of stuff. There were sort of a couple of taxi firms there, and uh, girls who seemed to be keen to encourage you to go in and, and sample uh, whatever was offered there. And then, then there was this strip club. As so I owned the premises, uh, and I was the business side of the thing. Okay. I was the calculating one that used to have to pay the rent and all the rest of it. Peter was the uh, the excitement of it of, of our of our partnership. And I said, well, wait a minute, 
we're not sure this idea will work. What we'll do is, I'll tell you what we'll do, we'll give it six weeks. Mm. We'll make a, a kitty here of 500 pounds each, mm -hmm. and we'll spend that on advertising and signs and so forth, etc. And if it works, it works. If it doesn't, we've had some fun. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's exactly how, how the store kicked so you, off. You, then I put this out in private eye. And this is, a, this is really a historic ad, because without that ad, there wouldn't be a comedy store. We wouldn't be sitting here 25. I'm quite convinced about that. Because the ad said, I wanted frustrated dentists, accountants, wannabe comedians, a new West End comedy club. We thought we'd get 30, 40 answers. We got about 150. Mm. Uh, and the, the queue was right up the street uh, for the auditions. And the very first person we auditioned was Alexi Sale. <laughs> you know, people often say to me, Alexi, what is alternative new wave Marxist comedy? And I say, sod off, you nosy bastard. There's a guy standing there in a leather jacket, burly guy, stocky guy. He was about, looked in his mid-twenties, I guess. And he looked a bit of a thug, actually. And he had, I think, a black leather jacket, pair of jeans, and he was chewing gum, I remember. Yeah. And he looked a bit menacing. In fact, he, he looked like... He looked like he might have wanted to beat me up. I tried to strangle Peter Rosengard. He was just, you know... Extremely annoying individual. <laughs> <laughs> you, you, would, you want to, really. He launched into this uh, amazing monologue. I, I go into the cake shop. He went into a cake shop. That was. I'm not going to try doing Lexus. I say, can I have one of them buns, love? That sticky bun right there, that sticky bun. And you know what the woman said to me? She said, what is a sticky bun? You know, so we get into this, you know, <laughs> philosophical discussion about the nature of existence, you know. Yes. And then it ends in a fight. She, she jumps over the, the counter, comes at me, and I just twatted her with the cash register. What he had there, this intellectual thug character, was mm -hmm. absolutely brilliant. Now, can you imagine Peter and I are sitting there in an empty room, and the first guy to walk on is this, is, is this, is Alexi. Yeah. The Scouser. Yeah. Actually, another way you can spot the middle-class houses in Stoke Newington, um, they've always got them Suzuki Jeeps parked outside, you know. I think it's so important to have four-wheel drive when you're going down to Sainsbury's. <laughs> I'm actually very grateful to the Arts Council to help us cheer the place up, you know. Um, big khaki murals painted by colourblind Mexicans on acid. And they used to send round street theatre groups to frighten people. Like, I don't know if you know the theory behind street theatre, but it is, if you've got a white face, a red nose and baggy trousers, you're going to be funny. Didn't work for Mussolini, did it? So, you got very lucky. Very lucky. I mean, I, I looked the up the scene first man that walks in. Thank you, Comedy God. We've now found our host. The very opening night was a bit of a sort of farce, really, because it was, a, it was an opening night, so I thought we'd better invite every journalist in, in London to come along and ply them with lots of drink. Last Saturday night, I climbed the stairs of the Nell Gwynn Strip Club in Soho and just spent the most bizarre three hours you could possibly imagine. On Saturday at midnight, tops are covered up, sequins put away, and the Nell Gwynn becomes the comedy star. Well, one of the pieces of good luck I had was to say, I will not stop the striptease show that was going on earlier in the evening. I'll put this show on at midnight. And because I put it on at midnight, on a Saturday night, mm. it, it made it very special, very, very bewitching. <laughs> Everything else is closing down. We're opening up. This is the very first night of the Comedy Store, and this is the very first time Arnold Brown has walked onto a stage. How does it work? Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I was an accountant at the time, and... My first so-called joke was, I'm an accountant, I check things. And I was about to say, uh, can you hear me at the back? And someone shouted out, we can hear you at the back. I want to ask you tonight to bear with me. Can you hear me? No. <laughs> and I was gonged off, actually. Because they had this kind of Arthur rank gong mm -hmm. to make mm -hmm. it more exciting. Mm -hmm. Nobody had a conception uh, of what five minutes was. Yes. Um, some of them were doing 20 minutes, 25 minutes. We did all sorts of things. We cut the lights, we cut the sound, we put the lights and the sound back up, and they'd still be there. And another mm. thing, mm. you know. Mm. So uh, we had to devise a way to uh, eventually to get people off. Mm -hmm. And that's where I came up with the idea of the gong, which suited uh, Alexi to a T, mm. if you can follow. Uh, mm. He'd have the gong at the side of the stage. Mm. People were given these instructions, you've got five minutes and no mm. more. Mm. Uh, and you must get, obey the gong. Yeah. 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 
Yeah. They're asking for more. They're the ones who come here for their 200 hours community service. Oh, I was a real bastard. A major figure in the early history of the comedy store was Tony Allen, whose passion helped to shape a new attitude to comedy. Tony Allen was, is the sort of the, the godfather of comedy. He, he was doing alternative comedy before um, anyone else was doing it. And I think he, he was doing all, this sort of comedy in a pub in Notting Hill at least three weeks before the comedy store started. This drunk homosexual Pakistani squatter takes my mother-in-law to an Irish restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> Mind you, I have got prejudices. <laughs> There's some minority groups that I loathe. Like the Metropolitan Police Force. You know? I was writing um, with a guy, we were, we were playwrights, and, uh, and he said, have you seen this? And it was uh, Evening Standard, and it was a little tiny bit of the Evening Standard. Comics wanted, mm. and den you know, dentists wanted to tell jokes. I was like, some, some nonsense. And I saw that, so um, he said, you should do that. I said, yeah, all right. Taking up smoking, it's terrible, isn't it? Last November, I was really trying to smoke, you know, trying and trying, couldn't get it together at all. <laughs> There'd already been a sh one show, and I went the second week. So and there was all sorts. There was dentists telling jokes. And as soon as I did it, I thought, right, I'm going to... And I didn't go down badly. It worked. It worked. I thought, oh, this is good. This is it. And I liked it, because it was dodgy and interesting. And I immediately... Uh, phoned up everybody in there and said, right, this is, this is it. And uh, people like Jim Barclay and Andy Delatour. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, my name is Jim Barclay. I'm the wacky and zany Marxist-Leninist comedian. And it's my job to come on here and tell you jokes which precipitate the downfall of capitalism. So here we go with a start of a tip. <laughs> perceptive of you out there, I am, in fact, bald. <laughs> no, I just wanted to say that, you know, because uh, if I don't say that, otherwise I get a lot of heavy responses from the audience, you know, like, Oi, Mazda light bulb, you know, things like that. Yeah? And, and Keith Allen, I started to get Keith Allen down there, who was squatting up the road from me. The other guy who was really uh, important to the comedy store was the danger of Keith Allen, mm -hmm. who was a kind of part guru, part wanker. Mm -hmm. You know, and a kind of... A I ganker. <laughs> or or woo-woo. <laughs> Before we go any further, I'd like now to take this opportunity to do a tiny little slice of the act for all those grovelling, cretinous, moronic comics out there in Noddy Land. Well, I mean, I loved it. And, and, and what I loved about it was um, there was no expectation. Nobody knew what was going to happen. So that meant that it was a very fertile audience and you could, you could actually do what you liked. And, in fact, people did do what they liked. <laughs> That was the sound of me earning ten quid. <laughs> the best thing he did, and it's the funniest thing I've ever seen in comedy, he came on with no clothes on and did a ventriloquist act. And he just stood there, he started talking to his, his puppet, um, and uh, every now and then he would readjust his, as what we call in the law, his person. And he would just carry on, and he explained, he was, this may look like a radical act, but it was just the oldest way of doing ventriloquism known to man, is that the idea of ventriloquism really is that you can't stop your, your lips moving, but the idea is to stop the audience looking at your lips. And nobody <laughs> in the audience has looked at my lips since I came on. He used to wind up the audiences and tell them that his mother had died a week ago, and then he said, oh, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I, I love you, man. <laughs> Keith was an iconoclast. I mean, really, he was what I wanted to happen, and it did. And uh, when Keith started doing it, I thought, now it's serious, now it's going to happen, whatever I thought. And I was on a mission to change the world, and we ended up changing comedy, OK. But when Keith, when Keith got into it, it really felt like we were going to do something, because he was just so passionate, and he was just so on it. And, and so funny. It was amazing, I think I probably... I mean, it was very influential on me. Mm. Because what, with Keith, what you, what you got when it worked was that, you know, you did genuinely think he was insane, really. I mean, and that he was making it up on the spot. All right, John. Hello, John. How are you doing, son? All right, son. Terrific. Fantastic. Hey, John, can I have a pint and me hat, please? Yeah, fancy seeing your boat on this man of it, eh? Well, John, you seen who's here? So, alternative comedy, where does the term come from? It was Tony Allen who went on to, to invent the phrase alternative comedy. Yes. And I clearly remember 
Then Sometimes Paul, he denies it. No, it's true. I was at the meeting. There was a meeting in what was the West London Media Workshop over in Notting Hill, and there's myself, Jim Barclay, Andy De La Tour, Tony Allen, Alexi Sale, Pauline Quirk. Pauline Melville. Pauline Melville. I'm getting very worried, you know. Lady Diana Spencer, Prince Charles' girlfriend. She's getting ever so thin. <laughs> no, she is. I don't know if you've noticed. I mean, she was always slender, but now she's getting really thin. Oh, I do hope she hasn't got worms. <laughs> and we had this meeting, and it was a, with a view to uh, getting some kind of generic name, you know what I mean, so that bookers would understand what they were getting. And I remember they came up with alternative comedy. I said, what? An alternative comedy. I said, are you fucking mad? <laughs> they said, what do you mean? I said, why and why do I want to be an alternative to anything? My whole raison d'etre is, is to be me, to be a part of it. I don't want to be an alternative. Because obviously you're setting up some kind of hurdle, you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, well, go on then, be alternative then. Everybody said, no, it's not, we don't, we don't want a name like that. So I thought, oh, all right, I'll have it. And then yeah. I started calling myself an alternative comedian. Tony Allen was fantastic. He was sort of, sort of like a mentor, because he was, um, I mean, he's always called the godfather of uh, alternative, alternative comedy, but he would, he would say, he'd say, well done, lads, that was great. It's nice to see a double act. Can you do levitation? No, no, no. <laughs> Can you do um, hypnotism? <laughs> oh, Jesus. <laughs> Can you, uh, can you do, um... Mind reading? I doubt it, Steve. Need a bit of practice for that. <laughs> He'll also tell you off for swearing too much. <laughs> so, so the comedy police? <laughs> yes, yeah, sort of, yeah. But at the same time, he was totally supportive and very funny himself, you know, he used to watch him. To many people, the new generation of comics were defined by their politics and united by a common enemy. But it wasn't really that simple. I always hated that, you know, just having a go at Mrs Thatch, really, cos it was, you know, it's easy, that mm. kind of... Uh, you know, I always, when I've been a, you know, being a ex-communist myself, I always hated communists more than anybody, more than I hated Mrs. Thatcher, really. Where there is doubt, may we bring faith, and where there is despair, may we bring hope. Honestly, I don't, I don't ever remember doing a Thatcher joke, and I don't think anybody did anything about Thatcher until the Falklands. I don't think she was an issue. Mm. And Mrs Thatch has got a lot to be proud of, and I think she should be supported. She responded to the pensioners' pleas for an extra five pounds in the cold. Of course, she didn't uh, realise that they meant each, you know what I mean? <laughs> what was once called alternative comedy is now often called political correctness, so is political correctness a good or a bad thing? It annoys me when people say, oh, we're all too politically correct. I mean, it's just rude and mm. clearly... Jokes can carry uh, a political message, clearly. Mm, mm. Uh, and if you're doing jokes about killing Jews or something, mm. then in some way you're pandering to an audience, if they're laughing, who are up for that kind of thing. Mm. I mean, jokes do bear a political load often. Mm. Mm. And to pretend been. that they don't is stupid. People know uh, when I tell a gag about anything at all that there's no malice in it. None at all. What do you want? <laughs> Fish and shit! <laughs> I'll have a face you give the ship me up, Bob. You slant eyed yellow faced bastard. There's no malice in it. None at all. I can remember this, this uh, act coming on, and uh, he's gone and done the most racist, sexist, homophobic routine that you can ever see in your life. And he's totally stormed the room, you know, and he, he's got, like, his minder with him, and he had, like, a dinner jacket on, bow tie, the lot. And I can remember him going past, there used to be this little sort of uh, gallery area you could sit. I can remember him going past, and he sort of, like, winked at us, the so-called uh, alternative comics, and he goes, that's comedy. <laughs> <laughs> but Rick, Rick Mel, Aid Edmondson came down to the store. When would that fit in, roughly, do you think? I, mean, I, I, was, I always remember them being there. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's the ghost for Jack? What's green and hairy and goes up and down? What? A gooseberry in a lift. It kills him. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'd like to tell the gooseberry joke. But, but how does a gooseberry get into a lift? Beg <laughs> <laughs> your pardon. Said, how does a gooseberry get into a lift? How the plop do I know? <laughs> <laughs> it just seems a bit improbable. Well, maybe somebody brought it into the lift. How the hell do I know? Didn't do I have to say everything? Rick, uh, actually took the piss out of all of us. And I didn't quite realise it at first, but Rick the poet yes. was actually taking the piss out of... All, uh, certainly of my excesses as a sort of politico, 
and, and, and everybody else's, really. Do I love you, Vanessa? 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 Vanessa, do you love me? Vanessa, you've made a mess of my life, Vanessa. <laughs> Shut up! <laughs> Rick in particular, I mean, nothing against A, but Rick in particular had a sort of quality of funniness about him, because sometimes they were just goofing around, as, as they have done over the years uh, quite successfully. But as a stage performer, Rick just would, would, could come on and go, Neh! and people would, would fall about. Along with Rick Mel and Aid Edmondson, there were other like-minded acts who wanted to spend more time on stage. One of the, the, the great acts at the comedy store was uh, Nigel Planer and Peter Richardson, who were called Outer Limits, who did musical parodies. What's your name? Uh, Neil. Neil. Right, I'm going to tell you something, Neil. Yeah. I could have you up under Section 3 of the Music Act. <laughs> <laughs> What's that then, you prat? <laughs> Peter Richardson was a kind of theatre guy and uh, he wanted to do a show rather than just this uh, democratic anyone can enter uh, comedy store and he took some acts from the comedy store well he took Alexi when Peter went off and rented the comic strip club I did think the comedy store would collapse once mm. I left well it's, it's time will tell <laughs> It's only been 25 yeah, years. Yeah, I think, you know, but it's that, you know, you when you're younger, you think that, you know, you think, one, that everybody knows what you're up to because you've had one little piece that big in the New Musical Express. Mm. But also, you think that, I th genuinely thought that it all depended on me. I was like, it's such nonsense. I mean. Peter Richardson engineered the comic strip's breakthrough into mainstream television and carved himself a niche as an anarchic director of TV programmes, comedy films. His latest success is Stellar Street. Yeah. Oh, hello, girl. Y you can't park there. What do you mean I can't park it? Because it's controlled parking. You're going to pay now. Bollocks. Look, my name is Michael Kane, and this is where I park my bleating car. Well, I do remember very clearly, of course, the first proper tryout I did. Um, ben Elton was the compare. Yeah. And I was watching um, these two girls called um, French and Saunders, mm -hmm. who I'd never seen before. Yeah. And they were great, and I went on and did a little five-minute thing, and they swallowed me up, and I just sort of crumbled. Yeah. <laughs> and, I, and I came off there, and I, I remember bursting into tears out in the street, outside, kind of just... <laughs> Here's David Bowie singing his new single called Where's My Sausages? <laughs> Could you give us a touch of the Bowie with the sausages? Oh, yeah, the Bowie, uh, David Bowie singing... Where's my sausages? <laughs> they're not... <laughs> and, he, and, he'd go, and he'd go, they're not where I put them yesterday! And then the next time was, I like cheesy footballs. <laughs> the ones we used to have at parties! <laughs> and I like them very much. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's quality gear, isn't it? Uh, what? To Mick and Keith. Urgent start World Tour Monday at the Lincoln Stadium, Seattle. That's 48 hours away. I'm going to have to get some new frocks and everything, aren't I? That first was... recollection of you it, on a stage is wearing pyjamas. Pyjamas came Paul fairly... Martin. Yeah, Paul Martin was my real name. Uh, and you I... did this wonderful, wonderful act of the copper <laughs> in court. Policeman on acid. Yeah. On Wednesday, Beautiful. 14th of October last at approximately 10.43 a.m. <laughs> while Pat rolled in along Streatham High Road, I observed a motor vehicle illegally parked outside the all-night Clement Attlee massage party. <laughs> uh, then he goes on to, I questioned the occupant and Mr Jackie Stewart, who said, urinate off, you effing love child. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mr Stewart then, then apologised and gave me a yellow candy-covered chocolate suite known to the uniform branch is a smarty, yeah. which I now know to be an hallucinogenic drug. <laughs> but that was a setup. Didn't it? 35 minutes later, while sitting aboard an intergalactic spacecraft <laughs> bound the for the planet yes. Zanussi. <laughs> That's the one! It's all coming back! That's the one! I observed Constable Parrish approaching me disguised as a fortnight's holiday in Benny Dawn. <laughs> <laughs> Constable Parish, I said through the back of my neck. <laughs> <laughs> and what news of my Lord Buckingham? <laughs> After I played the store, I did it for the first time, here, uh, the old one, and it absolutely stormed it, as you say. And I walked home from Soho to Streatham. And I got back at about five o'clock in the Euphoric. morning. Just absolutely flying, because I oh, knew yeah. that 
it had always been something I'd wanted to do, to be a comic, to get on stage and do it yeah. from a very early age. Yeah, to actually do it, it's a different thing. And Exactly. Talk and about and it, to yeah. actually then do something that, that works, because I knew enough, I, did, I, I didn't know anything about performing or anything, but I knew that if it works, that's not lucky, that's not a fluke, that's because it's funny. I remember doing a gig, and it had gone well, got on a train, an overground train, and climbed out of the carriage and lay on the roof all the way back to Cannon Street. <laughs> <laughs> and I swear, I got off at Cannon Street and I was black. <laughs> I mean, because it's just covered in soot, you know. I was black. But that's how exhilarating it was when it was good. Yeah, yeah. It's just, it's the best drug in the world. Yeah. Which is, I guess, why I couldn't carry on doing it, you know. <laughs> you <laughs> killed yourself again. <laughs> Behind me is the original comedy store. Now, as other acts began to break into TV and radio, the new wave of comedians behind them, inspired by what they had seen, started to play the comedy store themselves. But this time, it was the new comedy store. This one closed down, the new one opened in Leicester Square in 1983. One of the acts that used to play out a fair amount was Bob Mills. And the other day, I took him to that second store, to a place he hadn't been for about 10 years. OK, Bob, this is uh, the entrance of the comedy store, as it was. The Leicester Square comedy store. I didn't remember no, that being there. That was different. That yeah. wasn't there. So wow. that, they were still there. This was the difficult part of the room. Yeah, this was. You couldn't see them. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny when we go back to a place. This, this is roughly where the stage was here. That was the stage. Did it come out more? I think it probably did a little bit, but I'm beginning to get goosebumps, to be honest. Yeah. Are you? Yeah. From, from a heckle point of view, there, was, there were dead areas, and they're always the places that I remember really, really spiteful heckles yeah, yeah. coming from. Rather than heckle me, someone in the front, front uh, row uh, just flicked a napkin at me. And it hit me on the knee. It was, you know, <laughs> it was nothing. Yes. You know, it could, a paper napkin. Yeah. And that, that hurt so badly that he couldn't even be bothered to throw a bottle at me. You know, <laughs> I wasn't even worthy of that. The comedian climbs onto the stage and truthfully points out that the microphone smells of sick. So does your breath says somebody, get on with it, says somebody else, please, settle down, replies the comedian responding well, I'll, st I'll start this routine if it kills me. There is an outbreak of cheering at the mention of his death. Get off, says the one who said get on with it. And the comedian comes up with a line so apt and incisive that any further heckling is redundant. Unfortunately, he comes up with it on the bus home. <laughs> A lot of people puked on me shoes. I had four pe people puke they on me shoes. They were horrible shoes. Yeah, well, <laughs> yes. I don't remember any heckles because I, what I did, I was so nervous about doing it because I knew how hard it was that I left no gaps. Right. I tried to leave no gaps. So if somebody opened their mouth, I'd just go blah, 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 like this. It was just pure survival instincts, mm. really. Mm. I get so nervous, you know, when I come on stage, I tried everything to get rid of my nerves. I tried drinking. But drinking is bad for your body. It's true because it makes you do things you wouldn't normally do and say things you wouldn't normally say. So I'd walk on stage after a couple of pints and I'd go, hey, feel so massive, uh, and then walk off. Because <laughs> it was quite a scary place to play. I, my act had somehow evolved so that I used to sort of attack the audience before they um, even heckled. You know, I used to do my put downs first. The things like men like you don't grow on trees, they usually swing from them. And um, who does your hair? Who is it the council? <laughs> I should have reserved them for when I was heckled, but I, I, I just didn't really. I used to dive straight in with some poor man in the front. Oh, good Lord, you're very close, aren't you? In a particularly unpleasant shirt that you didn't manage to iron. <laughs> <laughs> this, man, uh, this man dyes his roots black, Lord. <laughs> so, what was your name? Oh, that's enough about you, John. <laughs> I want you to shut up now and act like a man. <laughs> or don't you do impressions? Um... The fact that he took the time to write that I think is, is wonderful. And down here we have our box office on our left and a selection of adverts here. Comedies, unofficial national theatre. I don't know what you like with acronyms. Now let's go into the auditorium. It's a busy night, as you can hear, because the comedy store players are about to go on stage. So if we go through here, we see that busy, busy auditorium. There's a bar at the back over this way. Here's a man carrying two pints of beer. And if we follow this way, this is quite a good way to the stage. Normally, the audience wouldn't come this way. As you can sense, there is a buzz. 
there is an ambience, there's a real thrill about what's happening this evening. Now, I'll just take you to the front here and just say that if you can hence feel the atmosphere, feel the ambience, feel the sense that follow me now as we go into the Comedy Store Players dressing room and they're just going to be this way, so just let these gentlemen finish here and enjoy your beer. And I'll just go in here and I'll show you exactly what's going to happen. They don't appear on television much these days, so um, let's have a look to see how they actually get ready before an impro gig. Well, as you can see, it's lots of fun. And up here we have the auditorium, the one we've just left, full of people. Let's go out there, let me show you something no comic has ever experienced. And that's it. Silence. Because you either get big laughs here. Don't you wipe your eye. Ring, ring the banjo. I like that good old song. How did we get from this to this in the space of four years? Well, it's down to a place to provide it a platform for a whole new generation of comics, London's Comedy Store. Comedy Store first opened its doors in 1979. I first appeared here doing stand-up in 1982, and I still appear every week at the Comedy Store with the Comedy Store players. We're an improvisation troupe, we make it up as we go along, it's jolly funny. Here is a marvellous picture of Robin Williams. I've always admired this when I walk down these stairs. The Pete and Don at the Comedy Store. Thanks for the break, Robin Williams. Well, now hang a star. Let's go on with the show. Let's go on with the show. We're in the heart of the Comedy Store. This is the third Comedy Store you, 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 you've owned. Yes. Um, and this is the best, would you say? Well, it's reputed to be the world's best, as uh, Mike Wilmot, a famous com Canadian comedian, uh, declares to all and sundry from the stage, and uh, even when he's in the comedy store in America, uh -huh. which must piss them off tremendously, <laughs> that London has the finest uh, comedy room in the world. You're in the wrong business. I mean, forget comedy, forget being a movie star. Well, you get people screaming at you. But here, just for this moment, we have silence. Savour it. You won't be hearing it again. There's no 